One of the girls he met at my house, he had been talking to her and I didn't know it. And he had been sleeping with her too over at the house where he was living at. And they both kept it on the low. He ended up sleeping with five of my friends. Crazy, crazy, crazy. It's no accident that sounds like you're leveling up in a video game. 48% of 18 to 29 year olds have an online dating profile. Make them work for it. 45% of people say they're more frustrated with this form of dating than hopeful. There are so many people you can connect with. Should I swipe right? Swipe wrong! Swipe wrong! Setting the record straight on dating apps. Everyday people telling everyday stories of the swipe right world with your host, Chaos. Well, I know he had a good time. You know what happens here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and of course, good night. You know how this works. Whenever we are here for you, whenever you are ready to listen to us, this is the Swipe Wrong Podcast. I am Chaos. I am the guy that gets to take you through the journey of the madness of the online dating world. This is the number one podcast amongst Disney villains everywhere. How we doing? How's it going? Doing outstanding? I hope so. Hope you're doing outstanding. Hope the world is treating you well. You're enjoying some sunshine, getting some negative ions, some vitamin D. Uh, This week, this week was a fun time. Uh, I had a great conversation with this young lady. She does a lot of great work. Beautiful soul. Amazing human. Uh, and just an interesting, uh, interesting conversation for sure. But let's do some housekeeping real quick. Let's keep the house. So make sure you like, follow, subscribe, write a review. Let us know how we're doing. Send us an email, swipe wrong pod at gmail.com. Give me a call if you like, uh, 317-426-6616. Would love to hear everybody's story. That's the whole point. Everybody's story. Want to hear it. Get everybody's story out there so you all can kind of understand you're not the only one who is attracting the crazy. Everyone I know is starting to feel like they have a target on their back and Robin Hood is slinging the arrows and can't miss. It's not the case. There's some good stories out there, too. I promise. This week, though, we do have another interesting story, one that's going to make you go Jesus, I really need to keep my eyes, ears, and you know, I talk about background checks a lot. What I don't talk enough about is trusting your intuition. Definitely do that. If you have a bad vibe, if you have a bad feel, if something kind of pops up and you're just a little like, I don't know about this, trust it. Just trust it. It's always safer to trust it and vet it and dig into it than it is to ignore it. And that way, you know, it's just all the ways that you can possibly be sure. So enough of hearing from me. So you know where we go now. Sit back, relax, enjoy, put your feet up, grab your popcorn, get it buttered if you like to. And uh, if you're in traffic, Please, please, please don't hit that person in front of you, behind you, beside you. Don't drive into oncoming traffic and enjoy Latchkey Con. Did I forget to mention we do have a word from our crack staff legal department? And here they are. Disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions or any entities they represent. This podcast is about dating experiences. It is not to say one dating app is better or worse than another. So the where I usually start, it's um, the apps. How long have you been on the apps? Off and on for about... Three years. Three years. Okay. And and what kind of took you there with divorce? Was it just like, hey, let's just give this a shot. I'm tired of date what we call dating in the wild or how did it how did it happen? Basically, I would say I'm a single person, never been married. Okay. So just kind of single and looking to do something different and something new. I'm I'm familiar with apps because like I mentioned to you, um, I run a company where we actually provide services to people in prison. So I'm familiar with apps because we put people, customers in prison on the app, meaning that um, they pay our company and they're on something called like CoreLinks or JPay. And we set up like Facebook, LinkedIn, dating sites. So I'm familiar with the dating sites. I've been doing that for about 10 years. So since you've been doing that for so long, that's kind of fascinating. How did you get into that? And how does that work for the for the for the guys who are guys and girls, I imagine, who are who are in prison? Well, basically, um, 
I have a nonprofit organization already working with prisoners and we help with like legal and other things to help them while they're in prison. And I had a guy about 10 years ago say, Hey, Tawanda, I know you guys are helping with like legal and people getting home, but while we're in prison, you know, we still need to meet people and et cetera, et cetera. And he talked about um, this company that he knew about that was doing Facebook and a few other services and they were charging like $50 a month. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my gosh. So we started providing those services. And May May 27th will be 10 years we've been doing that. And um, so basically prison has changed over the years, right? So people have access to – people think it's, it's, they have computers, but it's through a system. So it's not like I'm on Zoom with you and I can see you. It's not like that. Um, but they have access to where they can log in and email. They can email people that they have on their email. So basically, okay. they email my t- my staff and say, "I want to purchase this service," and we give them the different ways to pay, whether their family pays on cash app or our website, or whether they mail a check, and they purchase services. A lot of people in prison they have jobs, families help some of them, and some of them just kind of have money from other businesses that they had before prison. So they purchase services to stay in touch with family, loved ones, or some of them who don't have anyone. They want to meet people. So we put them on Facebook, LinkedIn, and then dating sites as well. It just kind of really depends on what they're looking for. We also offer tech services. So again, we're always studying the market for different websites Uh so we can know what's going to be prison friendly, quote unquote. So I'm pretty familiar with most websites. Okay. So as far as the dating sites go, we'll just start there. Is it all the standard dating sites or have you created your own uh, brand, I guess, for the people who are, who are in prison? We have not created our own brand. We were talking and thinking about that once, but the sites that we put them on are pretty much tag high five, um, local space, um, plenty of fish, eHarmony match. And I even have a few that are big spenders that get on sites like seeking arrangements. Okay. And seeking Have arrangements. Have you heard of that one? That like, I said, you, well, you couldn't even I'm drink guessing. your coffee. I'm, yeah, I stopped. Yeah, like, well, just because, <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, okay, this sounds like it's set up for a conjugal. But I that's why I stopped and curious. Is that what that is? Or am I just need to shut up and drink more of my coffee? Drink more coffee while I tell you. Seeking arrangements is basically a, a sugar <laughs> site. It's mostly uh, people on there. Um, like this guy that we got on there um, is this Italian guy from New York that, you know, is well to do, et cetera. And he's looking to meet a certain type of woman. And of course you want to get on paid sites to meet better quality. And then, you know, he's in a means to get someone he can spoil. So seeking arrangements is basically, it's a site. If you get on, you know, if you're going to be the person you're going to be paying and you're going to meet someone, they're going to be looking for an allowance. Or uh, okay. sugar daddy okay. or whatever. Or okay. sugar mama. Okay. No kidding. So you facilitated that. So he said, I want on this one. And then do you create the account for him? Uh, and then you you just say, here's your sign in and password. You're good to go. Just and all that. No. How's it go? My, my staff, they when they send the money and sign up, my, remember, they don't have, they can't see each other like me. You, all they can do is get on an email back and forth. So okay. my staff is their eyes and ears. So basically when my staff go and create the account, we do give them their email and password for safekeeping because it's, they pay for it in case they get out of prison soon, they can have it or just because it's theirs. But they, um, my staff will email them the profile. They email it back, filling in, you know, inform- well, they don't fill it in. They actually write in whatever the information is. But we actually run the site for them. We're their eyes, we're their ears. And um, then they pass messages to the different women or men. And um, they just kind of pass messages back and forth. The goal is the person in prison wants to meet someone and say, hey, Jane Doe, I'm in prison. I pay a company to pass these messages. So if you're cool with it, give me your email address or phone number gotcha. and let's cut the middleman out. Gotcha. Some people want to talk through the app forever. Of course, you probably know that already. Yeah, but yeah, some yeah. people say, OK, you know what? I'm with it. I'll cut the middle person out. So let's talk. So we have people we we made love connections. We've had people get married. Really? We've had so many people get visits in prison through getting them on dating. So, yeah, we had a, a guy that went home a couple of years ago. He was in prison and he was just kind of doing his time. He met a girl on tag, ended up marrying her. He had had a business before prison. She had a small struggling business. He he leveled her business up and they bought a big half million dollar house in Atlanta. Yes, we have a lot of incredible stories. Um, That's pretty awesome. 
And every story is not incredible, but yeah, it's been some really incredible stories happen over the years. When you started this, did you have to get, um, I'm assuming you had to get some sort of approval through the system, prison system, to be like, you well, no, be, be, because basically when, when we started this service, any, anyone that's in federal or state prison has access to an email system, whether it's CoreLinks, okay. JPay, or whatever the system is. You, they can add anyone's email address that they want to. Now, whatever you talk to them about, that's between you and them. As long as it's nothing illegal or unethical, you can communicate with them. So we're communicating with them. And what we happen to be talking to them about is them getting on a dating site. Okay. Because uh, keep in mind, a lot of people in prison, of course, they will probably want to add their family and friends. But a lot of people's family and friends, they either die out, they get too busy. We provide services for people in prison that families are not able to provide, don't have time to provide, or they don't have anybody. That's that's interesting. And so you just go through what an email list and reach out to the to to the guys or girls that are in prison and just just it's almost like a marketing (laughs) campaign. Is that how it works? No. Basically, when I started doing it, I started working with a lot of people in state prison. And one guy in a state prison, this was this was about 15 years ago. He had a, a family member that was in a federal prison. And he said, hey, listen, I met this woman. She has a service that they're providing to prisoners. I think, you know, you can benefit from it. So the guy wrote us and said, hey, I'm interested in getting your service. What is, how can I what's your email address? So I can get on get on email with you. We gave him our email address and we had him on core links. And okay. then about six months later, he told about 100 people. Oh. Hey, I met these people. They have this service. It's going to be helpful to you. And that's how they have to connect with us so they can get our email and add us or they can get our email from another prisoner. OK, OK. So you truly are word of mouth amongst one to another to another. Are you like has, has it carried from other prisons? Like if, if uh, people get transferred to other places, have they all across you? the nation? I no had about 12 people at our email the other day. They were in Oklahoma City. Oklahoma is one of the places when you're transferred, like in a federal prison, the feds are different than state because they move all the time. Uh, when they transfer, they have a couple of hubs that everybody meets at. And Oklahoma is one hub where you'll meet people. You know how the airport is? Everybody's going somewhere in the world. Yep, well, that's Atlanta. how the Oklahoma yeah. is. All these prisoners are in Oklahoma and everybody's going somewhere in the world. So we've had reps that work with us and they say, hey, Tawanda, I'm getting ready to transfer. I'll be in Oklahoma in two days. You know, I'm going to put the word out. Oh, and they, awesome. we send them flyers. We send them cards. Like, we know when some of our regular customers are traveling because we get a slew of people at our email because <laughs> they're repping us. Yo, add this company. They're going to hook you up. They're going to find you a holiday boo. Because every, like, Valentine's, we do a holiday boos. Christmas, Father's Day, Daddy special, whatever it is. That's awesome. So, yeah, we bring we bring it to life. Yeah, absolutely. That is awesome. So, I guess I'm curious also about the other side. So I understand the people inside are just eager to talk. Is it hard to find people to talk back to them? It is It is hard. It was hard, especially in the beginning. We created something called Love During Lockup. And we have a website that we're revamping. And um, this is what we're going to build as far as our site. Um, we have Facebook group. We have plenty of Facebook groups. Um, I have a Facebook group for men that's interested in meeting women pen pals. And that group has hundreds of people because guess what? Men love to meet women in prison. It's like a fantasy. Um, they are obsessed. Really? And then we have a lot of prison pen pal groups that we're in that we send our people's profile. And then we have a group on tag. We have like our own group. So what people don't realize is, first of all, people in prison are people too. They need love. Yeah. Yeah, Everybody's sure. not going to be in prison forever. Yeah. For and sure. for two, we educate a lot of people and we have over the years say, listen, we work with people in prison. They're really looking to meet someone like for dating or friendship or whatever. And we kind of educate them. And then some actually say, you know what? That makes sense. I'm kind of open to it. Some are open to it. Some are not. And yeah. you know, I respect either way. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it, it's just, uh, it, it's intriguing to to go through that. Do you see that? Like, does it get volatile? Do you see some, some things that just kind of shake out in a bad way? And, and obviously you've seen things that shake out in a good way, but what, what goes wrong? Oh, there's a lot of things that go wrong. First and foremost, there are people that we put on dating sites. Remember, we're people's eyes and their hands. The thing about a person in prison, they're in prison. You can go Google them. 
So they're not catfishing or anything like that. Sure. That's sure. who they are. This is the prison they're at because they can somebody can go and look them up. So you pretty much know who you're dealing with, right? Unfortunately, we've had guys on dating sites that's talking to women and of course it's a catfish it's not really her picture that's one yeah, thing sure. so they find out a year later you know what i don't feel in love with this girl she hadn't been up on visit yet with all these excuses and that's the daughter that ain't even really her yeah we've had okay. situations like that um we've had situations to where guys are talking to girls and it's not even really a girl it's it's someone that's trans that is notorious because honestly, on these sites, you can't tell. Yeah, Sometimes you sure. can't tell. Like yeah. the world has changed a whole lot. We've had situations to where a lot of guys in prison, unfortunately, they use these dating sites as their job. It's their hustle. Yeah. So they meet women, they meet certain types of women, and they feel like I'm going to get her or him. There's some people that say it's, it's gay for the stay, for example. Uh, and this is not to bash any anyone. But it's a it's a person in prison that acts like they're gay or they're bi and they get on these sites and they meet a man, for example, that's gay or bi and they finesse them because it's a money play. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. and that and that, that's how they actually live in prison, because some people don't have money and family. So they find a hustle. And unfortunately, that hustle is somebody is somebody's heart. Right. So we have had situations like that as well. We've had people we've had guys meet with women and build relationships and kind of fall in love. And they started sending her money to help out. People have disappeared, people's money. We've had guys write books because we have people that have businesses. They've written books and then different things and they sent it to that girl they've met and she disappeared. So yeah, we've had a lot of horror stories, unfortunately, really? because people aren't really authentic and they sometimes do stuff and they leave the person in prison holding the bag. Yeah. And, or vice and versa. They're as empty as they could probably possibly feel at that point, too. Like they were already. Kind of uh, oh, oh, yes. The hope you you have gangsters and people that kill people that has been that has been heartbroken, has been in tears because the thing is, trust is not easy. So when you trust someone and someone violates that trust, yeah. especially when you're in such a vulnerable state, yeah. that changes things. Yeah. Yeah. You start taking hope away. That's pretty rough. You got to have so many different people who just absolutely reach out and love what you're doing. Like you've met love, you know, got married and all that. Like you've given them hope. That's pretty awesome. How does that feel? Really, it feels incredible. And it feels incredible because when I first started working with prisoners, my focus was just helping prisoners with legal help or transitioning home, kind of getting their life together. Because I'm, I'm like focused on business all the time. And then what someone told me in prison was, Hey, Tawana, I understand you focus on the business aspect. We appreciate it, but we need love too. And I know you don't have time for that, but I'm like, okay, all right. <laughs> so when I got sold on it, I understood the importance of it and I advocate. So the times I've met or my staff has told me about situations where, hey, he was really using her. It pisses me off because it's something that's beautiful that can be a great win-win situation. So for the prisoner to play games, it makes me angry. Yeah. Or for them to meet someone that's playing games, that makes me angry because you mess it up for the next person too. But to know that there's been good people to have good situations, it's amazing. There's a guy that um that I've been working with for that's been in prison. He came home Wednesday for tw after doing 22 years, and he met a really great pen pal. Um, it's not an intimate situation, but it's a great friend, and they're actually doing a business together. They're gonna start a podcast. Okay. So it's been so many amazing connections and situations to me that's priceless because at the end of the day, people want somebody, people need somebody, people need yeah. a good friend, even if it's yeah. not a lover. Yeah. So yeah, it's been really good. Yeah. Someone to connect with and give them a little bit of hope, you know, that they're not isolated anymore. That's a big deal. Absolutely. And what we've understood and we see now more than ever, we talk about vicarious living and that person in prison is physically in prison but their mind is not because we've, we've, we've given them hope through social media. They on Instagram. Yeah. They know more about Instagram and Pinterest than you do. Because, <laughs> Probably. because even though we're their eyes and ears, they're getting it. We send them a publication every quarter with like pictures of different stuff. And then they're meeting people. We have a picture club. So when we travel to different places, if they're in the picture club, they get pictures of Dubai, the country, this place, that place. 
So when they're meeting this woman and man, it's, it's they're living. It's a whole other level of life. And it helps them do their time better and stay focused on freedom and getting home and not doing something crazy to get more time. So, yes, yeah, so it's a whole lot of different advantages to it. So how do people contact you if they're curious? If anyone is interested in meeting someone in prison, which I hope that you give someone a chance, because, again, it's not just about dating and getting married. Good friends um, is definitely an option or just getting more information about being connected with prisoners. Yeah, our website is my E-L-I solutions dot O-R-G. That's M-Y E-L-I-S-O-L-U-T-I-O-N-S dot O-R-G. And you can just message us through there and uh, we can give you whatever information you want. Because it's really about becoming educated and understanding that people in prison are people too, and they need good, vital relationships so they can be better and come back home and be productive into society. This is um, you spin. I imagine this is this is your world. This is your you know, this isn't a side hustle. This is what you do. Is that right? This is my business. Um, this is one company. We also run a publishing company where we publish books for people in prison, um, as well as people that's not in prison, and as well as we have a nonprofit organization. Yeah, we we are an organization that understands that over 2 million people are incarcerated across the U.S., and 8 million are under correctional control, meaning probation, parole, et cetera, et cetera, and that prisons are continuing to get more people. And it's a problem. It's an epidemic. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize that this affects everyone and it affects everyone because for one you can be one step away from somebody doing something to your loved one and you knocking them out and they're not getting make up and you're going to prison or you being a victim of home invasion sexual assault anything so this affects everyone so number one i want to make sure as i talk to people in the community Hey, prison affects you because you want to know what kind of people are in prison, what kind of people are getting ready to come back home and how you can keep yourself safe so you won't ever become a victim. And then you want to also find out how we can steer people in better directions so our youth won't continue to be going to prison because it's really ridiculous. And the thing is, what people don't realize is prison is not like it was 25 years ago. A lot of times in these states, when you go to prison now for doing anything, you're going to get 20, 30 years off top. So a lot of these kids is in these gangs and doing all these things, thinking they're big and bad, guess what? They can't do this time. They can't do that time. That's what it's going to be more suicides and more depressions and more deaths. So it's definitely not a side hustle. This is a business that we've been building for 15 years. We work with thousands of men and women across the nation. And we also work to keep families encouraged because sometimes the person that goes to prison, that was the breadwinner. So families have become homeless and in poverty because that breadwinner, whether it's a drug dealer or not, is in prison now. We also have an academy where we teach skills. We teach skills to prisoners. Um, Anyone that's in prison that signs up for our academy, we teach them credit building, business credit, personal credit. We help them start a business like trucking business. That's a real huge business for truckers. We also work with their family members because when we help people build skills, then people can channel that energy to something positive and progressive and learn how to make legit money because 25 years ago, people only knew how to go rob, steal, and sell drugs. But guess what? Now with an 800 credit score and you're building business credit, you can go buy a truck. You can go do Airbnb. You can go do Turo. So yeah, we actually teach people businesses so they can have a different skill. And guess what? For a person in prison or for a hustler, it's another hustle, but it's a legit hustle. And it can make you six and seven figures plus. That's awesome. How did you go from like you've added phases? So like, did it start with the dating and go to the publishing and then go to the business management? I started this company because with where I'm from, which is a small town in South Carolina, I was looking for one of my classmates that had went to jail when we were in 10th grade and he did 10 years. And um, then he came, he got out. And when I went back to my hometown, I was looking for him and they said, Oh, he's back in prison. And I'm like, what? He had went to prison for a bogus charge. So I got in touch with him. I ended up meeting his cellmate and some different people. And I started kind of advocating for them. They were having problems in prison. They had rat problem. They had issues with pork. The food was horrible. And then I started helping their family members. And a lot of the family members were people that they didn't have a lot of education. They really didn't know how to do stuff. They didn't have the power to pin. So I would show them how to write stuff up. So 
as an, I first became an advocate for people in prison that were being discriminated against. I had people that were like Muslims and their wives was coming to visit them. The prison was making them take off their hijab, which is against the law. It's a violation of their religion. So we started there. Then I've always been passionate about loss. I partnered with several attorneys that would donate time and help people in prison with cases pro bono. So then we started doing cases. Um, start doing legal, which was amazing. We helped so many people get free, give time back. So through doing that, I met people in prison and they said, oh man, I'm in prison, I don't have any money. I got 20 books I've written, da, da, da. But you know, they don't have any money to publish them. So then right. we said, you know what? We're gonna find people that don't mind helping, donating editing services, typing services, and I'm gonna see how I can help you with some of those books. However, when we get the books published and you make money back from the book, then we got to offset and be able to pay something back to people that donated it, et cetera. So that's how we started publishing. And the last thing that came along was the dating services because okay. we had everything. We, we're we like, people say like, you're like the Amazon when it comes to prisoners because we do everything. <laughs> and what we don't do, we are partnering with someone that does do it. That's awesome. So let me go here then. So your journey, your, your, your story through singlehood and being on the ass for three years, I'm sure is intertwined. So like, how has your dating experiences been? Cause I'm sure you've shared this and some people have been like, Hmm, or what the heck is that? When I first started getting people on dating services in prison, I was never going to get on there because I never wanted to be on a site that I put someone in prison on and they didn't you know, hit my profile up. Like that yeah. would not be good. Like I'm all about professionalism and not being a conflict. But um, but yeah, so I've been off and on certain sites. So I get on a paid site, first of all, and I make sure people are not probably on it. But um, it's been leery because because honestly, you know, you see so much happen on these dating sites, like they're not gonna catfish me because I'm free and they're free. So we're gonna be on video chat within a day or two, but I know people are full of shit. I mean, just people are just sure. not really authentic. So my experience has been crazy. And unfortunately, I'm not on any sites now actively because I'm just kind of disgusted and disappointed with a lot of these sites. A lot of them have bots for one. And yeah. for two, um, as soon as you get on a site, people hit, hey, baby, what's up? I yeah. inbox you something. And then they inbox your dick picture. And that's yeah. insult like People, what's one guy said, you act like I killed you. I said, you didn't kill, but you disrespect. Like, like, why would you do that? How would you? I mean, and, and a lot of these sites, regardless of what the sites are, people, are, they think it's an online booty call site. They think every site is a site where they're going to meet up for sex. And they think it's Craigslist Personals, right? And they're looking for really one night stands. Yeah. Um, and that really kind of has put a bad taste in my mouth. Yeah, it's like that. Some some will make it out to be old school backpage uh, from from exactly. Yeah. So you know yeah. about backpage, right? What you know about yeah. backpage? Uh, look, I there was this one time at Bandcamp. No, I'm just kidding. No, just just familiar, <laughs> <laughs> just definitely familiar back in the day that before internet went nuts. Like that was that was where uh, the hey, I'm just looking for a massage, you know, type of type of ad would. Be, yeah, so bring yeah. some roses. Yeah, exactly. Right. And then then I will make a house call for a massage. And that, that was that was it. Did you have any like it, was it mostly just guys just saying, hey, let's hook up or or was there was there anything more nefarious or just some bad dates, too? Now. All right. So let me let me tell you. So first and foremost, um, if someone inboxes me something then I'm blocking them and we move, we move forward. I met a couple guys that I had a great conversation with. But also, Chris, honestly speaking, like, again, I used to be a social worker and I'm really, in, and I, what I mean by that is I'm in tune with people. I listen to the words. I know I'm good with communication. I met several guys that we just kind of like had really great communication going back and forth. I'm a really great listener. So then I found myself being a counselor because they was really uh, sure. depressed and stressed sure. out and, and they had issues with their job or their baby mama. So that was kind of annoying. But I met this one guy, and this is what I want to tell you about. But before I tell you about that, I got to I got to tell you about a back page story really, really quickly. OK, please. We had this one young like I got I got to put this story out because it's crazy. And we have this one young lady in prison and she had met our company about two months before she went home. She heard about us. She's getting ready to come home. A lot of these women in prison, they're in prison for doing drugs, doing selling drugs with the man, prostitution, 
or they were on drugs so bad they were doing anything, even robbery, to get money, right? I didn't know. We don't look them up. We don't do anything because we're not judging people. She signed up for our services years ago because I think Craigslist was out there. And when Craigslist was out there, we had hundreds of women because they eat off Craigslist. Eat meaning men are obsessed with women in prison. They yeah. spend money because they want to be on the phone with a woman to get some off. Anyway, we met this girl for two months. We put her on the site. She met a lot of guys. She was excited, da, 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 whatever. All right. She came home from prison and she contacted my company and said, hey, I'm home and I want to see how I can still pay y'all. And we were like, you're home. You can do this for yourself. She was like, well, I don't really have time. I'm going to be looking for a job. I want y'all to put me on the site again. And she went and got a, um, like a prepaid card to send her money or whatever. I didn't really know what was happening. But anyway, she wanted to get on Backpage. We had never put people on back. We had used people on Craigslist and not Backpage. Right. Long story short, Chris, after three or four days, and she paid for like three months, after three or four, and she, oh, wait a minute, and when she went home, she went home to a trailer and to a brand new truck that a guy from Craigslist had bought her. Hello, oh, somebody. Shit. Okay. So after three or four days of her calling us, harassing us, getting us the money, we put it on the site. We gave her the logins and password. Because she didn't know how to set it up. That's what it was. And um, we gave her the login and password, but we hadn't heard from her. Like, we was like, what happened to her? Did she log in? Did she not log in? So we logged into the site. She had hundreds of messages, and we didn't know what happened to her. About three or four months later, she contacted us. She had gotten locked back up. Oh, shit. Whatever her charges were before, she got locked up for prostitution. And was getting ready to be on a federal investigation or something. So she was like, well, I hope they don't contact y'all and thinking y'all are my accomplice. And we were like, wait a minute. What? Wait a minute. <laughs> hold, hold, hold up. Hold up. Listen, we was like, listen, lady, we're done with you. We don't know nothing about no prostitution. <laughs> because what happened was, what we didn't realize when we did her profile and back page, what she, and again, we live and we learn. We we, we learning. She the ad that she put out there and the roses or whatever it was was meant payments. We did not know that. Uh, Remember I told you earlier about roses. So yeah. however she wrote the ad, people that knew it was in that life, they understood it. Even the law enforcement officer that busted her ass, but we did not know. But but we were so scared. So the lingo, the <laughs> verbiage that she used identified somehow in there that I'll take payment for X or whatever. X, and, and, yes. and, and, and like Google's not going to interpret that for you. So you didn't know exactly what she was saying. There was no Google Translate for Backpage. So oh, yeah. that's, that's what did. happened in your case. huh? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But we and she was apologizing. But bottom line is. She had had a history of doing that. She was under, she had been to the federal prison because of that. Wow. And we had to sever ties with her because I'm not going to let my good be spoken evil of. And we were trying to help her, but we had no idea sure. what she really meant was I'm trying to get home and prostitute to make more money to live this lifestyle that I want to live. So I just had right. to throw that out there. Um, no, that's we crazy. Have, we have to be careful. But okay, so back to the dating site. So I met all these different people. I mean, I met a lot of different people. I met people that I actually still text and talk to today. That's mm-hmm. nothing intimate, but it's it's a cool situation. We laugh about different people they met on the site. But I met this one guy on the site named Danny. Um, and, you know, anyway, I saw his pro- I'm like, oh, my gosh. He's like, um, well, he looks amazing. Da, da, da. His conversation was incredible. His wordplay was really, really good. So we were chatting. And he said, um, well, let's meet up. And I'm like, normally I wouldn't meet up that fast. I'm like, okay, as long as it's a public place. So I actually met him at a store, a store across from his university. He pulled up in this black Lexus. Mm. And I'm like, damn, he got out. He had on like this little muscle shirt. It was a um, mega sapphire, which I'm in a sorority. So I'm like, okay, you're cute. He's like, yeah. And he likes, you know, start barking or whatever. So we talked and chatted. We had like the best conversation ever. And he actually lived about an hour, hour and a half from where I live, but I was getting ready to move to the same city he lived in. So I'm like, hmm. I'm getting ready to actually move. I'm moving to the same city. So we were like, let's get together, da, 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 whatever. And I'm like, hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> the girl. <laughs> so um, I told my friends, I met this guy. It was, I mean, you know, it's right. Like, we, we, we coming out of COVID. So it's like uh, okay. COVID, okay. It's, we, not, not a hot girl summer or anything like that, but 
Yeah. Some new, some adventurous, etc. So right. anyway, um, a few weeks we, we were talking on the phone. Like, when are you come back? I said I'll be there in a couple of weeks. So when I moved, he said, "What do you? What can I help you with in your apartment?" He came over, was helping me with stuff in my apartment, putting stuff up. I'm like, oh, I got a man in here getting stuff done. And as we started talking and vibing, I mean, I, it was definitely like a lot of chemistry. And I just thought he was like, mm, not really the marriage type, but somebody you can probably have fun with. But I got a vibe from him. I don't know if you ever met a person like everything's checking out, but it's still something. It's like some kind of vibe, like yeah. some, something ain't right. But you, Intuition, but you can't. Yeah. It's not you're not checking a box, but you feel like it's something, right? Yeah. So um, that's kind of I felt like it was something with him, but I really wasn't sure. And again, I think about what I've done all these years. I work with people. I work with all types of people. So I'm like mm, not really sure what's going on. So bottom line is um. I said, you know what? I want to be cool with him, but I don't want to do anything else because I don't. I get a. I get a vibe. I get a feeling. Mm-hmm. All right. So long. Fast forward. We started hanging out. He was coming to my house on a regular basis. We was playing cards. We ended up kind of becoming really, really cool because I liked him as a person, but it was just something about him I couldn't put my finger on. And then also, I was asking him certain questions about where you're from, da da da. And he just was a little vague. And he lives in a condo across town, et cetera, et cetera. So, um. One night, one of my friends came to visit, and she kind of hit it off with him, and she slept with him. And I'm like, damn. All right. I guess it's okay. Another week, one of my other friends came. She hung out, and she slept with him because he's a really good-looking guy. Right. And he, and then he ended up telling me that he actually lived with a girl. I'm like, okay, maybe that, that's what it was. Uh-huh. So, um, you know you know, everybody's a private investigator these days, Chris, right? Absolutely. I'm friends like, of the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you know what? This guy's hanging at my house. He told me he had, he had his nice black Lexus and that he actually, his, for profession, he always carried around a, you know, like the business checkbooks. And he said he installed carpet in people's house. And my apartment actually had tile floors and I really wanted carpet. So I, he actually gave me a really good estimate. So I thought to put carpet down and, you know, he brought me the, the estimate on the letterhead for his business and stuff like that. So I said, you know what? Let me do a little bit of investigation. <laughs> so I started. Um, I googled his name. There was a whole bunch of Danny's with his last name that he um that he had, but he told me he was from this other city originally. So I started looking different things up, and um, I can't remember how he ended up giving me his address. But I used to work for a company where we paid utility bills for people. So I ended up contacting the utility company. <laughs> oh, nice. And, hey, I'm- yeah, so I'm calling them about so and so verifying the balance because yeah, so basically I use a skill that I had from a previous job many, many years ago. So I was able to find out um the name of the account, uh-huh. which wasn't his. I got the girl's name. Uh-huh. Um so I ended up getting the telephone number on the account, which was the girl's name. Her name was Kendra. And and again, not only had I met this guy, he was at my house on a regular like every other day. He was sometimes spending nights when it was real late, not nights with me, but just nights when he was hanging out. And I did like him. And, not, and then he was still, he was he hit a couple of my friends. So I'm like, let me really see because I'm not from this city either, right? Because as a single female, we have to be careful. For and sure. And I broke one of my rules with letting somebody who I don't really know come to my house off the jump. I really shouldn't have done that. Um, but anyway, I ended up calling a number and I, I, I said, hey, Kendra, you don't know me. My name is T and I'm calling you about Danny. And she said, I'll, I've been trying to find you, too. I'm like, huh? Because she had been hearing him at home while he was on the phone with me. So so she said, I think we need to talk. And I'm like, yeah, I think we need to talk. So I ended up going, like a dummy, I ended up going over to their house. And again, as I'm thinking about it now, I really shouldn't do that either because that was kind of dumb because I don't know them. I went over to her house, and what I found out was it was her condo, not his. Right. And her name was Kendra. She had twin daughters that were 10 years old. And um, she had met a guy like two years ago named Danny, who was a professional. You know how those people people play professional sports overseas? Oh, sure. Remember, yeah. Whatever yeah. that's called. Yeah. All right. Because he's like six foot four, 230 pounds, light skin, green eyes. He's like a total package. Right. So she met him like at a gas station. And um, he had just came home from being injured. But his, but his profession was he was an athlete overseas. Okay. So he was injured 
So she ended up meeting him and liking him. Next thing she know, he spent a couple of nights and he never left. Oh man! And he had been with her like a year, year and a half. And I was like, really? So this is your place? She's like, this is my place. She got a full-time job. He has no job, no income. She said when he gave you the estimate for the carpet, he had me do it up on letterhead, but I didn't know until after the fact what it really was for. I'm like, so what was he going to do with my $3,000? She was like, he was just going to keep it. Oh, shit. I'm like, what? Hold up. We're not done. And she said, boo, and his name is not Danny. His name is Rodriguez. Oh, shit. So when she gave me his real name, I went back to Google. <laughs> I ended up, um, and he had a grandmother that lived in another city. Long story short, I'm trying to rush the story. No, so don't rush up, the story. Don't rush it. You oh, take your time. Okay. You're good. Right. You're good. So I end up um, finding out the city that he was really, really from, because I had his real name now, I end up calling a number that I found through whatever my methods was, and it was it was his grandmother. So I called, and I said, ma'am, I don't even know how to say this, but my, my name is T, and I met your grandson, whatever his name is, and I got some questions, some concerns, and she said, baby, I don't know what that boy problem is. Be careful, because he just don't tell the truth. Protect oh, yourself. Wow. That's and crazy. I was like, damn. And then I was trying to figure out what happened. Then he just kind of, I think he found, he found out I was doing a little snooping. So he hit me one day and said, I'm going out of town. I'll, I'll be back in, in a couple of weeks. So I was driving one day down. I, and this is how things work. Because remember, I'm a private investigator, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. certified. I certify my own self being private investigator. <laughs> I'm driving girl. down the street one day. Um, and I, I passed by a place that fixes cars and I don't know why I happened to look over and in the, in, in behind some cars, you know how you have a car and I guess you take it to the shop to get fixed and maybe you don't have the money. So they put it in the back of all the cars. Yep. Yep. So I happened to look over and I saw a black Lexus. I said, so I pulled up to the place. I said, Oh my gosh, I'm, you know, I'm checking out some cars. I said, Oh, I like that black Lexus back there. <laughs> nice. Look at you. And, um, and they were like, well, if you stick around, we may be selling it. And I'm like, no. what? They said the guy brought it in here for something simple to be done to it, which only was like $1,000. And they fixed it, but he never he never, he never, never paid. So he never came back, right? Wow. And I was like, that's crazy. Like, why would he just leave his car? So what I ended up finding out by the license plate on the back. So I ended up, with, I ended up going back there and getting the license plate. Did some research. I mean, I know everybody. Ended up finding out the car had it was a rental uh, from like the year before that he had some girl rent in a different city, and he just never turned it back in. He just left. It wasn't even his Lexus. Hold on, we ain't even done. So w- one day, again, but he, and, and me, me and him are we still cool, and I'm still doing my investigation, but I'm I'm not really sure what's going on. Also, when I went to visit his house. Kendra was like, yeah, and you hook him up with all these women. I found one of your friends. Um, one of your friends is a nurse. I'm like, yeah. She said, well, I, she, I have her badge. I'm like, well, one of the girls he met at my house, he had been talking to her, and I didn't know it, and he had been sleeping with her, too, over at the house where he was living at, and they both kept it on the low. He ended up sleeping with five of my friends. Crazy, wow. crazy, crazy. Right. So, so one day, I was at my job. Um, and he called me, I think I was seeing the client or something like that. Anyway, he called me and said, Hey, listen, um, at McDonald's, you're going to get something to eat. And then I was just kind of hanging out. What time are you going to be home? I said, probably about an hour or two. He said, I'm going to get come out and get your key. And just go, I'm going to hang out. And I was kind of like, not comfortable with that, but I'm sure. like, okay. So he came by, um, the place, the company where I was at, he got my key and, um, and he left. Cause I live like five minutes from there. Right. And after he left, I said, I don't really want him to have my key and be in my place. Like I'm not there for another hour or two. So anyway, I wrapped everything up. I said, I'm going to go home. Cause when he called me, remember he was, he was he hit when he got my key, right? He, he called me from McDonald's. He said, I'm at McDonald's. You know, you want something? I said, no, I don't want anything. But within the hour I was home. And by the time I got there, he was in, he was in my apartment. He was laying on the couch and, um, and my key was on the table and I grabbed my key. I said, Ooh, okay. I got my key back. 
Yeah. So um, three things, and, and I'm gonna be done with this. So a few weeks later, when he went when he went out of town or whatever, um, one of my next door neighbors has said this guy who next door was like, "Man, you live right next to me. You won't even let me get no key, but you got old Danny with a key." I said, "What are you talking about?" Oh, he said, you gave him a key to your house, so he's always in and out your house. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What I found out was that time, like a, a few months before, when he came and got that key for me, and he left where I was, and he went um, to McDonald's. He wasn't at McDonald's. He was making a copy of my damn key. That's so He had probably crazy. been to McDonald's earlier that day because when I came home, there was a McDonald's cup. It wasn't no one food. It was a cup. Right. As I'm playing all of this back in my, my mind, because there's only one time he ever had my key, and it was only for like an hour, no more than an hour and a half. Right. He made a copy of my key. Wow. And remember, I had just moved into his apartment because I wasn't from this that city. Yeah. So I would go back home to visit my family every other weekend because he was always at my house. So he knew my routine. Jeez. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and remember, and where I live, I, I, I'm a, I don't deal with a lot of people. I happen to know the one guy across the street named Champ, but everybody else like older people or people that's booked and busy. So he was able to go in and out my place and people wouldn't think anything because they was always see, they always see him there. Sure. You know what I'm saying? I felt so violated. Gosh. I couldn't even believe it. So I'm, I'm in spate to gadget at this point. I did not tell him that I knew, I felt like I was so mad, I was so angry, but I still didn't confront him because I was just wondering, like, what is the what is the big plan? Like, what do you want? So um, I ended up getting my dad to um, come and change the locks on my um, door. He put, uh-huh. like, security stuff to my window. So I said, the next time I go home and he try to come back, he'll see, hmm, can't get in. Um, but one day... Um, there was another girl that I had met that he was dealing with that lived like in another city a couple of hours away. And um, we he every time he would meet a girl, he would call and say, oh, this is my BFF. Because he knew at this point, we're just friends. So when he called me with this one girl, um, I had her number. So I was at this point looking for him to figure out like what's his end game, what's going on. I didn't know if I was going to call the police. So I didn't know what I was going to do. But I had this girl that I met through him, not Kendra, but another girl that lived in a different city. So I called her one day. I said, hey, you remember me? I'm, I'm T. She said, oh, yeah. Um, now, at this point, he's going by the name Rod. His name is Rodriguez. So he told me that's just a name he used when he meet people. Just call him Rod, right? Oh, so I wow. called the girl. I said, hey, I'm T. Remember Rod called? He said, yeah, how you doing, T? I said, um, I'm calling to talk to you about something, and I don't really know how to have this. Because one thing, Chris, you got to realize, when a woman meets a man, ain't nothing you can tell that woman about that man. <laughs> if she's, yeah. If her nose is open, she's really all into him. I said, I don't know you. I said, but um, I want to talk to you about him, but are you open to listening? It's not going to be good. She said, I'm listening to what you got to say. I said, he's not who he say he is. He's a scam. He's done a lot of things. He, he, you know, I, just, I told her a few things he had did, and she laughed in my face. Sure. And she said, you're just mad. So basically, she didn't believe anything that I said, and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wow. About two weeks later, she called me back in tears uh-huh. one thing that i noticed about him through my investigation he he found independent women his preference was independent women people that had their own place and that had vehicles that, you had to have something that he could benefit from yep because he didn't have nothing wow. you understand what i'm saying yeah so kendra had a great job she had cars she had this she had that I had just moved to the city. It was stupid. <laughs> no. But um, no, no, no. this girl, this lady, and she was this lady was older. She was like a widower. Her husband had left her really well to do. Um, so when she called me that day, she was in tears. Oh, poor and girl. she was apologizing that she didn't believe me. And she told me that she had a room in her house that she kept locked at all times because it was her um her antique room. Because she was into like an- different types of valuable heirlooms and antiques stuff that she said it was millions in that room, like millions worth of stuff, which is why she kept it locked. And of course, he knew about the room because he, you know, he kind of moved in. And, you know, she said he was always so fascinated with like everything in the room. He just couldn't believe that she had all this stuff, da da da. 
So basically, he started borrowing her car, um, taking her her job. She still worked her job and keeping her car, et cetera, et cetera. Well, one day he did not pick her up from work. So um, she ended up getting a ride home and he's not there. And the antique room is broken into. And antiques and heirlooms are gone. Uh, So she contacted the police. She called me. She wants me to talk to the police. uh, I'm like, now hold up, lady. uh, I'm talking to you. Now you want to get me. I don't want y'all to get me involved with no popo, right? (laughs) So um, so I end up giving a statement about my experience and and my investigation. And and the police are like, you really was investigating. I'm like, sure it was. (laughs) And um, and they they added all this to this report, but she was I mean she was de- she had stuff from like her great grandmother, oh, her no. husband that had died, stuff that's is not replaceable. Like she oh. was done. Like she just could not believe that she was so hoodwinked by this green eyed bandit. Yes. And probably about four or five months later, one of my girlfriends called me on the phone and she said, "T T T T T." Turn on the news, turn on the news. I'm like, what? She said, Danny, Rob, whatever his name is. He um he was on like the most wanted something, something, something. No some local, way. The local town most true story. The because it, it's a small area. He was on like the little most wanted. He had taken that lady car. Remember, he didn't pick her up. He what what got him caught up was he was a whore. He's a big dog. He went and met this girl. That he started taking on the road with him. That was like 16, 17 years old. I think she must have lied about her age. Shit. But when he got her and she didn't come home, parents called and everybody's getting involved. So he ended up getting stopped because he's in a stolen vehicle with an underage girl. Oh shit. But what put the, the most wanted out on him was because the parents ended up finding out she was with him and she was underage. Oh. And they ended up getting him. Um and he ended up getting locked up. Holy shit. Like, <laughs> there is, like, it's a, like, it's a snowball. It's one thing. <clears throat> it's one thing that he took your key and then made a copy and then used your house for whatever sexcapade he probably did on weekends when you were gone. I have no fucking idea. Oh, my probably God. Probably just a place for him to have peace because all his other Could places be. was other people's places. And yeah. he knew I was not there every other weekend from Friday from when I leave on Friday morning and I'm going to all my appointments, I'm not coming back to the house until Monday. How did this affect you trying to date going forward to her? Well, first of all, I don't trust nobody. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. Like, <laughs> like, I, like, I don't like, OK, so like now do you just flat out do background checks every time? And I know that doesn't identify the crazy, <laughs> but it does at least give you a little bit more information. And, you know, when I saw you guys podcast Swipe Wrong, I'm like, oh, yeah, I got it. I've never told anyone this story other than people. Um in my in my circle and not not because i'm ashamed of it it's just because i never had a place to talk about it but i learned a lot because i could have gotten killed we you just can't trust people you got to do checks to some degree shouldn't i mean stuff that i knew you shouldn't invite somebody to your damn house yeah yeah, yeah. i know better than that but but as far as now well right now i'm not even open for any of that i'm just in a season of not available not even interested because I've really had a bad, bad experience, a bitter taste. And I'm all, I'm looking through everybody that I meet like, hmm, is that your name for real? You know, yeah, right. Friends? Yeah. Let me get your prints. But yeah, it, it's really, it really has affected me. And and everybody that knows me, it's affected them too, because they won't, I won't stop talking to them, encouraging them to be careful. Because I've had friends that's had worse situations. Hopefully they'll get on here and tell you about their experiences. Um, Please, I'll take it. But it's, it's definitely lessons learned. We got to be careful. We just yes. got to be careful. So right now, I'm not dating. I'm not interested in dating. I'm not open to dating. I'm just focused on what I do, which is helping people and focus on that. I'm sorry you went through this. I think it probably made you more insightful and, and just uh, uh, eyes wide open now. But God, I'm so, thank you so much for sharing it for people who go through some shit like like the like you turn into like they I'm surprised they didn't say, hey, you did your investigation. We're hiring, by the way, if you want. Yeah, we need a good investigator. <laughs> Oh my god! But you know what? I hate that I did too. But but honestly speaking, I know of people that's had worse situations. I've known of people that have 
met people and they who, wasn't who they said it was and they got sexually assaulted, oh even God. killed or robbed. Um, I've I've talked to so many people over the years since I, I'm I'm in the industry of this love and relationship thing that I, I do research and I get stories and stuff like that. So I've heard a lot of horror stories. So I take this as a grain of salt. Like it's lesson learned. Like yeah, because yeah. I knew better and I know better and I'll never do that again. Yeah. You absolutely beautiful soul. Amazing person. I, I can't thank Thanks, you enough for taking the time. Sure. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for being along for the ride of the Swipe Wrong podcast, where we take everyday people like you and me telling their everyday stories of their swipe right life. Show is produced by Jay Pelham. He is the host of Pelham Place. If you want to reach out to the show and tell us your story, we'd love to hear it. Give us a call. Google voice us at 317-426-6616. Leave your information and we'll get back to you or just your story. You can also email us at swipe wrong pod at gmail.com. We are on Insta, Facebook, TikTok. We're out there. I am Chaos, the host of Chaotic Commentary. You can find me pretty much anywhere that you see me. And next week, the saga continues. Swipe wrong. Swipe wrong. Swipe wrong.